We've been in this uh, series of messages and the conversations with Jesus, how Jesus interacts with uh, people in his life and how um, uh, he communicates important uh, lessons and truths, uh, reprimands and encouragements and all these kinds of things that, that, that we can apply in our own lives. Now, the one that we're doing today is... Um, it almost doesn't fit, but you know, as the pastor, I can squeeze these things and I can make them fit into the series, you know. <laughs> so that's uh, one of my great gifts. And so um, if you have a Bible with you, turn to John 13. And this is a, uh, an acted out conversation. That's what I'm calling it, because there's a lot of action in it and not a lot of dialogue until the very end when a little argument breaks out. Okay. So. It was just before the Passover feast, John 13, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God, and he was returning to God. So... He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured the water in a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that he had wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus said, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. Simon Peter said, hmm, okay then, not just my feet, but my hands, my head. Jesus said, a person who uh, has had a bath needs only have his feet washed. His whole body's clean, and you're clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place said, do you understand what I've done for you? So Lord, teach us. Teach us from this uh, acted out conversation. And uh, teach us how we might live and we might serve as you have done for us. Amen. I don't usually like preaching about this uh, chapter, and I'll tell you why. It's because foot washing seems so doggone foreign. Do you guys go to people's houses, or you go into a restaurant, and they pull over and they start washing your feet before you order? Maybe canless. <laughs> you know, maybe they're okay. Yeah, they might, but uh, you know, it, it's not something that we do. And so, um, you know, through the years and growing up, I was taught you know you need to wash people's feet, and I was thought. You know, we don't do that around here. We, I thought it was because we were Presbyterian, you know. <laughs> then I thought uh, nobody actually does that when you go to their house for dinner. Uh, and uh, well, I've had people over who they probably they probably should have done it. Uh, but that's a whole nother, another issue beside that. But, but there's something about this that seems a little bit awkward. And, and then I realized it was awkward for the first disciples too. For one, it didn't come at the beginning. You know, the tradition was at the start, you know, you wash your wrist. This came after dinner. So uh, it, there was no category to put this one in. And uh, so I've been thinking about this and going, okay, what does this uh, have to do with us? And what can we learn from it? What's happening there? Well, today we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper. This is actually the night of the Lord's Supper. It's all part of it, woven in. And um, disciples have gathered. And, and you notice that John writes that uh, it happens in a context that Jesus was very aware of the, the atmosphere of betrayal all around him, right? He was aware that, that Judas had made a deal with the devil and was going to betray him. He was aware that Peter was going to betray him. He was aware of all these things. And he did it anyway. Or maybe he did it because that's what you do in a context of betrayal. You, you get involved and you move towards and you serve. This, this is one of the most dynamic uh, 
examples of the servant leadership that, we, that we've heard about, we've talked about, we've read about over the years. But I want to tell you, uh, after the years that we've been together as a church, I don't think I've ever been in a church that reflected more the idea of servant ministry and getting involved. What you guys do week in and week out with each other, with the community, uh, different ways you get involved. Um, and, and I want to thank you for that because it's it's been really uh, healing for me to see that. Because, you know, it's, it's easy to be in a church group or a community group or, you know, PTA or wherever it is that you're involved. And, and there's people waiting around for someone to do the stuff, you know, and they're quick to want to manage what others do. But this idea of uh, we're not a church of managers. It was, if you see it, do it. And uh, if you don't see it, still do it. <laughs> That's great. And, and we jump in and we get involved. And you've done that. And so um, I want you to know that I've noticed that and, and I really, really appreciate it because now it changes the sermon. I'm not going to be scolding today. <laughs> Isn't that great? I don't have to. Well, I never have to, but sometimes I, I do it anyway. But um, the thing is, you have practiced this and, uh, and modeled it. And, and I think that's part of the... Um, sort of the humility and the uh, honesty that's taking place in Harbor Church is, is that um, there's no levels of uh, who does the work and who doesn't. Like, I, I moved this week. <laughs> I, I, I think in the Greek, it's I, I moved and I'm continuing to move. Uh, it's, there's no end to it. You know, last, last night, after like four 12-hour days of constantly moving, uh, it was... Uh, I thought, okay, it's all done. I'm going to lock up the house. And I opened a cupboard, and there it was all full. <laughs> no! Because <laughs> I can slow motion. No, not that. And uh, it's okay. But, um, but, but in the case of the moving, some interesting things happen. I, I realized that in moving, there's no supervisors. Did you notice that? Do you know that? Have you ever, anyone ever moved? <laughs> uh, I mean, I hired the moving company, you know, three neck tattoos and a truck. And the two guys were out um, at the truck at the start, so I went out to greet them, and they said, well, uh, we're not doing anything yet, you know, because the boss isn't here. And I thought, man, I wait till the boss comes, you know. The boss comes, and the first thing he does is jump in and start picking up stuff and carrying it and everything. He never instructed anyone on anything. He just started grabbing stuff and hauling it out, and, and they started doing it too. And I thought, that's what ministry is about. Maybe not as many neck tattoos, but but it's still, it's we just go and we get involved and, and we see what happens as God blesses us. Now, Judas, this betrayal, had already made the commitment to betray the Lord. And now he's sitting here. And I wonder, and I thought, if anybody's going to argue with Jesus about having their feet washed, it would have been Judas, right? You're not doing that to me. Because the separation had already begun to take place. It wasn't, though. Now, when you look at this foot washing, if betrayal is um, treating a friend as if you didn't know them, as if they were a stranger, you know, that's kind of what betrayal is. You suddenly start treating them as if you've never met. The opposite of that is the foot washing, which is you could treat strangers and friends as honored guests. The people in your life that you love, uh, people that you don't know yet, but you will be on. When you are doing the foot washing, when you're doing the serving uh, leadership, you're treating them like honored guests, re regardless of what the relationship has been up to that point. It's just the opposite of betrayal. Now, it's saying we're the same, which is a wonderful, powerful message that, that we can give to each other and to the community and to our world. There, there's no difference between us. If you have brokenness in your life and you share that with somebody, that's foot washing in that it said, you know, here's my pain, here's what I've been going through, here's what I, where I need Jesus to meet me today or this week. And they go, oh, wow, you're just like me. Okay. And then there's that identification. Now, 
as a born and raised American, I, I don't usually think in terms of identification. I usually think in terms of how different we are. I want to know the differences. I want to know where somebody's from so I can categorize them and put them aside, you know, or, uh, those kind of deals, kind of. And, uh, and I think I, I told you about a time that I was in India. I'm going to tell you again because it really strikes me as uh, it was an eye opener for me. And we'd been up in northern India in these remote villages uh, visiting and um, seeing uh, incredible ministries taking place among what are known as the um, uh, the, the untouchables, they were the um, outcasts, not not because they're thrown away, but because they're out of the caste system. They don't exist in, in um, Indian culture. So we were going up there, and, and a lot of them were turning to Jesus, and churches were being planted, and schools for women to learn trades and jobs, all these things. And the thing that we learned in it all was that... Um, it happened one day, it was a really bad day for me, and I was tired, and we didn't want to do anything, and we had to drive all day to a toilet dedication. Remember that? Do you remember I told you about that? A toilet dedication, and the whole village was their children, and all singing songs, and older people, everybody, the whole village gathered, and we were there, and I was the honored guest, you know, Dr. Westfall and these missionaries, because our church had put in some money to build this, the first public toilet in the, in the region. They never had that before. And it was really exciting for them. I'm going, yeah, <laughs> we drove all day for this, you know? Thought they wanted me to preach. And uh, no, they wanted me to watch the dedication of the toilet. And uh, and so we uh, we got there and this was going on. And, uh, and then it became, I started to realize what was happening. The, the, the outcasts, the untouchables, they, they were nobody, so their job in the village was to basically go around and scoop up the poop in the village from the, from the cattle, from people, from anywhere, and, uh, and they tried to keep the village clean, and then they would stack up the manure and dry it, and then uh, cut it into blocks that they would then use for cooking their food. So they'd cook their food on the dry poop in their homes. And um, that was their job for generations. And as the as people were turning to Jesus, they were learning skills, they were getting some jobs, they were doing things, pretty soon they, the, the work wasn't being done that the untouchables had to do. And, and it created all kinds of problems in the area because people of uh, in the caste system were saying, somebody has to do this. Somebody has to pick this stuff up. And so when, when this first public toilet was built, it changed the whole dynamics in the, in the community. So this is going on, kids are singing, everybody, their worship songs, everything like that, and, and uh, speeches are being made. And then they bring me up, Dr. Westfall from California, uh, where I was at the time, and, and we were, um, I was brought up there to be honored, and they put these things around my neck, this flower lays and all these things. Uh, it wasn't Hawaii though. and. Uh, and then they came up and they handed me this handmade shovel. It was kind of wired together and it was a rickety old thing. And they handed it to me and they pointed to the pile of poop and they handed it to me and they pointed and they kept going like this. And I'm not figuring out what's going on. And then it becomes obvious that I'm supposed to shovel that in there. So, and the whole village starts cheering. Hey, I'm getting momentum, you know, and I'm shoveling this and pretty soon the oldest uh, person in the village comes up and he takes the shovel from me, very elderly person, and he starts to shovel and they're cheering him. This is the greatest thing, the, uh, fabulous. And then the pastor of the church comes up and he shovels and they're cheering him pretty soon. And then it dawned on me. Ah. They were saying, you're one of us. You're one of us. You come from far away. You have a different life. Everything is different for you. And we may seem strange and our customs are strange, but you are just like us. There's no difference. You're a poop scooper, just like us. And we love you for it. I could shivers just telling you that. It's because 
we always say, oh, we're so different, you know. They're saying, no, no, we're not. We're really the same. And, and, in, and in Jesus Christ, we're, we're the same. We're lovable. We're not outcasts. We matter to each other. So shovel the poop with us. Now, I know that's a weird story, okay? That's a really weird story. But I think of that in terms of what the dynamic of feet washing is. It's saying we're in this together. There's no difference. And uh, in a world where everybody wants to see what the differences are so we can correlate and put pecking orders and stuff, this goes completely against that and says, no, 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 no. Grab a shovel. We're in this together. And that is so powerful. This is the only thing that Jesus, I think, as I read the Gospels, this is the only thing that Jesus told the disciples, I'm doing this as an example for you, and you do this with each other. It's the only thing. And yet, it's probably one of the most neglected parts of the Gospel. The only thing that Jesus said, I want you to do this, and it's neglected. Now, what's it take to be foot washers? First of all, it can never be forced on us. No one can force you to be humble. No one can force you to be a servant. It's a choice that we make. It's a choice that we make, and we only make it because we know who we are. We know where we're going. We know where we've been. We know that we belong to God. We know that we're loved by God and, and that nothing can change that. And so we can say, yeah, we're the same. It's a totally different thing if it's forced on you. It's a choice that we make as followers of Jesus to say, you know, I'm confident in my relationship with God. I know who I am. I know uh, that I'm loved. I'll, what's it take? What do we need to do? Let's get involved. Now, the second part of this is, though, not just that we're, we have this kind of idea of who we are, but we also, it's grounded in the relationships. This is probably one of the most relational things that we could do to one another, is, is to serve. And to, uh, because in serving, you start to know what people are like. And you usually find out the bad stuff first. Have you noticed that? The closer you get to someone and the, and the more uh, hands-on that ministry is, the more you go, wow, no secrets here. I, I had this Friday, we, Thursday night, I had, we had to be out of our home on Friday. And I hadn't arranged a cleaning service to come in and do that. Move out clean, you know, that thing. So I got on the internet and I was calling these places. They're going, great, we can do it. November 12th, we have an opening. No. You know, and, uh, and finally, I, I found this person who said, I could come at 8 o'clock Friday morning. Really? And uh, so she came and uh, it's fabulous. Worked 12 hours. And it probably still wasn't really done. <laughs> there was a lot of stuff. But it was... I felt so embarrassed half the time because she was going through things and finding things and doing things. It's like, whoa, she knows more about the West Falls than we feel comfortable, <laughs> you know? But she was so kind and loving. She was like, no problem. You know, this place was so clean, you know? It only took 12 hours to get it in shape. And, uh, but, but if you do foot washing, you know what you find on people's feet? Feet stuff. That's what you find. People have, well, not you guys. You guys have really nice pedicure kind of feet. But, but you know, those of you, some of us don't have pedicure feet. And, and we've got kind of, you know, gnarly feet. And, uh, and in foot washing, you start to see people the way they are. Um, after sin came into the world. You know, <laughs> yeah, right there. And, uh, and you go, wow, it's not pretty. Lives are not pretty. And you know what? I don't think any of our lives are really pretty underneath. Are they? Not really. I mean, I could put a little bit of nail polish on my feet, but they're still my feet. You know, it doesn't change anything. And, and 
But see, I think that there's profound joy in discovering that we're the same and we don't have to hide, we don't have to be embarrassed, and we don't have to go, oh, well, well they, they find out. And no, 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 no. Actually, we say, no, no, we're the same. It's okay. And there's a freedom in that, isn't there? We're the same. We're in this together. Now, another part of this, though, and this is, I thought this was really odd for the gospel writer, and, and uh, John, in writing this, didn't confer with me, so I'll correct him now. But I don't know if you notice this, but through that passage, if you look at it this week at home, it continually talking about evil, betrayal, the presence of Satan, through this wonderful kind of sentimental servant ministry example. And I think what that's saying is, Jesus is telling us, um, you don't have to be uh, in fantasy land about things to, to choose to serve. You choose to serve knowing that there's evil and there's sin and Satan's real and it's all woven in there, but we do it anyway. We do it anyway. We, we move towards each other and we, and we, and we hang in with each other when it's not pretty and, and we don't wait for someone else to step up. We just go do it. Um, I had an example of that this morning, actually. She's not here in the room right now, but, um, uh, Karen Van Hoos came in and I was talking with her over the coffee and she, she said, I don't know if there's anyone to work with the children this morning. But um, I'll watch and see. And if no one gets up to go with them, then I'll go in and be with them. But she doesn't know I'm telling you this. Um, but I thought, isn't that amazing? I'll watch and see. If no one's doing it, I'll just go and do it. She said, someday I'm going to hear one of your sermons, but you know, <laughs> not today, probably. <laughs> and I thought, well, she wasn't saying, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to call the elders and see who's in charge of scheduling. You know, it's like, I'll just go do it. That'll be fine. Can you show me where the copy machine is? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but you know, that's just doing it. It's, 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 it's not just an idea. It's not something we believe in. It's not a, a concept for Christians. It's, it's an action. And that's what Jesus, this is an active conversation. In fact, there's one verse that's, um, let me see if I can find the, the verse here. Um, verse uh, four, I think. Uh, he knew he came from God and all those things. So after the meal, he took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured the water in a basin, washed the disciples' feet, dried them with a towel. Verb, 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 verb. What is foot washing? It's not sitting around having good ideas about how people might share together. That's not it. It's you get up and you do this. Whatever. And you don't do it in a way that makes people feel worse. You do it in a way that makes them feel better. They're honored guests. Now, I told you at the very start, this is not a reprimanding sermon. You'll know when you get a reprimanding sermon. I'll, I'll let you know about that. This is say, I, I want to tell you, I have seen you do this over and over again over the last few years that we've been together. You see something, so let's do it. Just let's jump in. It may not be the right thing. It may be, maybe we'll come up with a better strategy in a year, but why don't we just do it? Okay. And I want to tell you that is one of the most powerful witnesses the most powerful ministry that we could possibly have. I been an old Presbyterian pastor for years. I mean, I've spent years on, on planning committees that never actually did anything. It was like, but boy, did we have plans. Oh, we had plans. Short range, long range, midterm goals. The difference between uh, having a goal and a mission statement and a objective and you know, all of those discussions had to go on for years and nothing is done but boy we got some good planning out there you know this is like the antithesis of that see the need be a part of it make the difference now it's interesting to me that um 
The only conversation that took place here was a confrontation. Peter and Jesus. You're not touching me. Mm -mm. Forget that. I don't need that. And so I think there is some kind of, in a real relationship, you always have kind of that back and forth thing. So we don't have to be afraid of that. Because it's real. But this is done in the context of the Lord's Supper. That's the thing I want you to know. We come to the Lord's Supper. We come being served and serving. It's all wrapped up in there. It's not coming to communion and having the Lord minister to you spiritually so that you can feel good spiritually, although that happens sometimes. It's the Lord serves you so you can serve. It becomes a, a transitional moment for us. So we do come to the table today. Willingly, hesitantly, hopefully, discouraged, fearful, joyful. We come however we are. And we say, Lord, wash my feet. Feed me. Nurture me nourish me and then live in me so that I can do that too. Make me a servant.